best friends. I'm Tabby. And I'm Caitlin. And today we are analyzing select works by the poet Sylvia Plath. So let me tell you a little bit about Sylvia. She's she was a, so sad. She was so sad. She was a professional sad girl. And first of all, the source that I used for her biography is poets.org. Um, Sylvia Plath was born on October 27th, 1932, in Boston, Massachusetts, to Aurelia and Otto Plath, which honestly, I love their names. Yeah, um, they're so cute. Yeah, but it turns out her dad was kind of a dick, but he died yeah. when she was kind of young. Anyway, she has a whole poem called Daddy. Look it up. We're not analyzing that. I one. almost did that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, basically, she compares her dad to a Nazi. So that tells you all you need to know. And her first a uh, national publication was in the Christian Science Monitor in 1950, just after graduating high school. So she was a very young lady. After graduating from college, she moved to Cambridge, England, and that's where she met the English poet Ted Hughes. And they got married like months later, which is crazy people behavior. Ted, what were you hiding? I feel like they just wanted to fuck and it was like the 50s and they were like, well, we got to get married. That's fair. Um, Her first collection of poems called Colossus was published in 1960, and she gave birth to two children with Ted, Frida and Nicholas, born in 1960 and 1962, respectively. And in 1962, Ted left her for another woman. Fuck you, Ted. Fuck you, Ted. In on February 11th, 1963, she died by suicide, and much of her work was actually published posthumously. Um, I think, like, three whole collections of poems mm-hmm. were published after A her death. A ton of them. So that sums up the absolutely bonkers and tragic life of Sylvia Plath. What I think is, like, so, so sad is, like, the time period this happened in you know that mental health was not taken seriously, especially when it came to women. I'll say women's, like, not even rights, but, like, this the treatment of women in that time was just so poor in general oh. that... And, and, like, uh, I'm sure she probably also maybe had, like, postpartum depression. That's what I was going to say, because, like, in 1962, you know, she had just given birth or whatever. That's when Ted ended up leaving her. And it probably was because she was in such poor mental health but like ted grow a fucking pair that's your wife but you married months after meeting yeah uh fuck you ted anyway ted's part of the problem (laughs) i'm pretty sure this poem that i'm about to read is about him Uh, probably but yeah go ahead and kick us off with your first poem so this is a little bit of a longer one but this is probably one of her most famous poems it's called lady lazarus So just a little tidbit about this poem. It was written almost a year before she took her own life. It is kind of longer. It is very powerful. I'm going to try to do it justice. It has a lot of enjambment, so it's a little tough to read sometimes. I've done it again. One year in every 10, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle. My skin, bright as a Nazi lampshade. My right foot, a paperweight. My face, a featureless fine Jew linen. Peel off the napkin, oh my enemy. Do I terrify? The nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth, the sour breath will vanish in a day. Soon, soon the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me. And I, a smiling woman, I am only 30 and like the cat, I have nine times to die. This is number three. What a trash to annihilate each decade. What a million filaments the peanut crunching crowd shoves into sea. Them unwrap me hand and foot. The big strip tees. Gentlemen, ladies, these are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone. Nevertheless, I am the same, identical woman. The first time it happened, I was 10. It was an accident. The second time I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rock shut. As a seashell, they had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I have a call. It's easy enough to do it in a cell. 
It's easy enough to do it and stay put. It's theatrical. Come back in broad day to the same place, the same face, the same brute. A muse shout. A miracle that knocks me out. There is a charge. For the eyeing of my scars, there is a charge. For the hearing of my heart, it really goes. And there is a charge, a very large charge, for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So hair doctor, so hair enemy. I'm your opus. I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts to a shriek. I turn and burn. Do not think I underestimate your great concern. Ash, ash, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there's nothing there. A cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling. Hair gone, hair Lucifer, beware, beware. Out of the ash I will rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air. Ooh. Wow. Chills. Yeah. It's a it's a very powerful poem. Especially knowing what we know about her personal life. So I definitely took this poem as almost like a confessional for Sylvia we start off she's saying three times every 10 years she's basically she's trying to take her own life the first time she didn't mean to the second time she did and it was stopped and this third time she is going to make sure it lasts and whoever stops her she is taken out with her a lot of this i think it's it's obviously focused on death but it's also focused on self-discovery and growth in a way and so where she fails the first time she makes sure she improves the second time and whatever tries to break her down the first time she's going to rise above that and make sure that she meets her own goals which is very tragic but <laughs> some goals girly also like wow I do think this was also like kind of a slight towards her ex-husband, obviously, when she's talking about the gold ring, the, you know, the soap, the gold fillings. This poem was written pretty soon after he left her, actually. Yeah. Um, so it was a year before she died. So about around the time that he left her. Jeez. And so I don't know if like what their relationship was or if he had tried to like stop her in the past, but she talks about the man who had tried to stop her the last time and that she was going to you know fight tooth and nail to make sure it didn't happen again so just a lot to unpack there yeah that was honestly like it was just so sad like it was yeah now that we know like that she did she did take her own life this poem it's so sad like she well, said, she was going she to do said, it. I'm going to make sure it happens the third time. And then she does die. Awful. Tragic. Um, so just a little bit about the structure of the poem, you know, kind of straying away from the, the poem itself. She kind of writes chaotically, which I love. Yeah. And I love I'm that sure it her. was, it's also very much reflecting like kind of her spiraling thoughts as she is dealing with like her own, yeah. you know, inner demons here. Um, so this is a free verse poem. It's comprised of tercets. So basically tercets are groups of three lines at a time. Um, and it does have slant rhyme. So it doesn't purposely try to lo- rhyme, but every other line sometimes does match up to create a slant rhyme. So I wasn't really sure what type of meter this was. So I did have to look it up. It is called iambic troaic meter, or at okay. least what's close to that, which I've never heard of. I'm like not great at I'm terrible like, at meter. Picking out meter. Iambic pentameter is like super obvious because of Shakespeare, sure. but like that's about it. That's about all I can pick out. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of literary devices in here. I think the most important one is enjambment. Yeah. And enjambment basically is there to keep the flow of the poem going. It also dictates what the flow looks like. And so there's a lot of double meanings throughout this entire poem where She's talking about herself, but she's also talking about herself in the eyes of other people. And so basically she feels like she was like put on display because that's how women were. They were expected to look a certain way, do a certain thing. And so she felt like she was almost whoring herself out emotionally. Mm -hmm. And also like with this history of like mental illness and like past attempts on her own life that comes with like a lot of you know speculation and like people paying attention to you and like it feels like you're being judged too so it probably felt like that made her the center of attention as well I also think it was really interesting how she does focus on 
the rebirth of Lazarus at the end there, but she does focus a lot on Lazarus in like the state of death because mm-hmm. it took him three days to rise again. And so the number three was really important because yeah. it took her three tries to like actually die. And so I think she felt more like it was that she had beat death every time and it wasn't really a game that she was wanting to play like she wasn't meaning to do that and so (laughs) it's like what else do I gotta do here yeah that was a a a heavy one and it's funny because that is one of her like most famous poems Mm -hmm. but I've actually not heard that one before really Uh, yeah like the uh, the only one that I had heard of hers prior to doing research for this episode was daddy Mm. so That was a really good one to start with. Yeah. My first poem is called Your, and that's uh, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, like you are. It reads, clown-like, happiest on your hands, feet to the stars and moon skulled, gilled like a fish, a common sense thumbs down on the dodo's mode, wrapped up in yourself like a spool, trawling your dark as owls do. Mute as a turnip from the 4th of July to all fools day. Oh, high riser, my little loaf. Vague as fog and looked for like mail. Farther off than Australia. Bent back to Atlas, our traveled prawn. Snug as a bud and at home like a sprat and a pickle jug. A creole of eels, all ripples. Jumpy as a Mexican bean. Write like a well-done sum. A clean slate with your own face on. Like and food analogies here. I know <laughs> it's interesting, but uh, I think this poem is honestly kind of like one of the few poems of hers that's optimistic rather than melancholic, and so I like it for that reason because it shows like the the happier side of you know of her life. So this poem is about her unborn child, um, assuming that she is like the narrator in the situation. So the first stanza is just kind of like telling us about this unborn child and how they're simply existing in like whatever way is comfortable, even though it seems like really nonsensical to like people who aren't a fetus in a womb. Like, why would you be more comfortable on your hands with your feet to the stars, you know? But it's just how babies are. (laughs) Yeah. And so like calling them like clown like, like, man, that's goofy, but that's whatever makes you kind of how they are. And the line, a common sense thumbs down on the dodo's mode. I really like that one because it makes me think of like how humanity is continuing on and like babies are being born long after the extinction of the dodo. I'm not sure exactly if that's what she was uh, meaning to write there, but I think that's one of the fun things about poetry is that there are multiple meanings once multiple people read it. So I really like that line for that reason. But mostly there's a lot of uh, metaphors and similes throughout this to describe how a fetus behaves in the womb. So that kind of sets up the poem for like what's going on situationally. But the second stanza is my favorite because that kind of reveals to us how she was feeling in anticipation of her baby being born. So vague as fog, expectant mothers like you know, maybe like whether your baby is going to be healthy, whether your baby is going to be born a boy or a girl, but you don't know what your child will be like until they're born. And so you are wondering like, oh, whose eyes will they have? Like, what will their personality be like? What color will their hair be? So the the child themselves are really vague until they're actually born. And looked for like male. I think that's my favorite part of this whole poem. It just kind of captures that feeling of like waiting for a delivery. And I feel like that used to be a lot more like of a commonplace feeling like back before like Amazon your Prime. Baby was coming. <laughs> well, yeah, that too with like a literal baby. But I was thinking like a yeah. uh, literal male, like back in the sure. day when you would order something and it would take like a week to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the anticipation would build and you're like, I don't know exactly when this is coming, but every day I'm looking out the window like to see if it's, if it's coming. So I love that part. And then the next lines go back to describing like as jittery and like anticipating the baby being born is like the baby themselves is completely aloof. They have no clue what's going on. They're just being a little fetus. They're snug as a bud, like a little sprat in a pickle jug, (laughs) jumpy as a Mexican bean. Um, And then 
lastly, I think the way she ends this poem is really beautiful. So she says, a clean slate with your own face on. Knowing what we know about Sylvia Plath and her troubled mental state, it kind of feels like she's just relieved and grateful that the child will have like a clean slate and their own face rather than, um, you know, having her hurt and stuff being passed on. It's like so she's sad. I know, I know, I know. And I know every child or every parent wants that for their child. They want them to have like a clean slate and none of the, none of the bad things that they dealt with. Um, But it feels like especially powerful coming from Sylvia Plath. It's so sad. Well, it's funny that in this one, uh, she was talking about the joys and uh, childbirth and children and the fresh starts I get. This one is not that. No, this one is actually quite the opposite. Um, (laughs) So the second poem I chose is Edge. I didn't mean to choose two poems about her suicide when I started this, but that is what it is. They're very powerful. It be like that. And these poems probably stuck out as more powerful to people once she was gone because of that. Yeah. So this one is Edge. The woman is perfected, her dead. Body wears the smile of accomplishment, the illusion of a Greek necessity. Flows in the scrolls of her toga, her bear. Feet seem to be saying, we have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled a white serpent, one at each little. Pitcher of milk now empty. She is folded. Then back into her body as petals of a rose close when the garden stiffens and odor bleeds. From the sweet, deep throats of the night flower. The moon has nothing to be sad about, staring from her hood at bone. She is used to this sort of thing. Her blacks crackle and drag. Wow. This poem was written six days before Sylvia took her own life, and it is her last poem that she ever wrote. I do feel like this was, again, a commentary of the treatment of women during that time. So it starts off with, the woman is perfected. Um, And to me, that says that She has only reached this perfection in her death because there is no longer anything that can be changed about her. Yeah. There's nothing. And you can't speak ill of the dead. Right. There's nothing more that she can do to prove herself, to, you know, make herself right in society. And that is very sad to me that the only way they can achieve that perfection is when they've died. Yeah. And so in this poem, the woman being spoken of also takes her children with her. And so when they talk about the night flower, I'm assuming that's like hemlock or some Mm -hmm. sort of poison that she gave them and these pictures of milk. And I feel like she does this because that's the only way that she can protect them from whatever trauma that she's gone through. And so looking back on the poem you just read when she's excited that they're going to have this fresh start where... They're not going to have to go through the same thing she's going through only to see in this one where she feels the only way they can be protected is by taking them with her in death. That is so freaking heartbreaking. And so I feel like a lot happened in the years between when that poem was written and this one. I mean, because this was probably written, I mean, we can assume this was written when she first experienced pregnancy. So like sometime prior to 1960. Um, and then she took her own life in 1963, just a few years later. Yep. I think my favorite part of this poem is the enjambment of she has folded. I know. Because it's like she's finally given in to that, like she's tried to fight it, like she's tried to not give in to these feelings, but she has folded. Ugh, it's heavy. Wow. It also, I like that it talks about the moon as well. So the moon is often associated with like fertility and with like the circles of life. And so the fact that like she brought these children into the world and then also takes them out with her, it kind of shows like the cycle of the moon as well. And that's why the moon is unbothered by it because yeah. it's just part of life. She's used to this sort of thing. The moon is also typically portrayed as a woman. And so if she as a woman has experienced these things, again, in that sense, she's also used to it and she has seen those things before. Yeah. The moon herself may have even experienced something similar. But again, just a really heavy use of metaphor, simile, and enjambment, which I think is kind of like her go-to. 
I think in Jam it is so powerful. I love it when in Jam it's my favorite. Jam it. It's my shit. My favorite device. The other thing, the only thing that I love just as much as I love in Jam it is a good dash. Like, yep, 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 yep. Throw a dash, and it's in hard there. to like when you're reading it. You can see it when you're speaking it. It's a little harder. I know these poems were not meant to be spoken aloud. They were meant to be read and cherished. And yeah. I mean, yeah, honestly, though, we're trying our best. Sometimes when you read it exactly the way it's written, it's like, yeah, that is how it's meant to be, though. Like, that's how it's meant to sound is how it's written. So I think it's it's okay that it doesn't sound conversational because it doesn't look conversational either. Also, so like, especially in Lady Lazarus and this one, like, I, I obviously don't know what she was going through, but it almost feels manic while you're reading it. Yeah. And I feel like it really reflects on, you know, what her mental state really was in that moment. Does. It does feel manic. Oh, she needed some lithium. <laughs> um, oh, the last poem that I'm going to share with you guys is called Stillborn, which is like, wow, we're keeping in theme with like the tragedies of uh i'm glad she didn't kill the children yeah because that poem edge really made it seem like that was her initial plan but this is stillborn these poems do not live it's a sad diagnosis they grew their toes and fingers well enough their little foreheads bulged with concentration if they missed out on walking about like people it wasn't for any lack of mother love oh i cannot explain what happened to them They are proper in shape and number in every part. They sit so nicely in the pickling fluid. They smile and smile and smile at me, and still the lungs won't fill and the heart won't start. They are not pigs. They are not even fish, though they have a piggy and a fishy air. It would be better if they were alive, and that's what they were. But they are dead, and their mother near dead with distraction. And they stupidly stare and do not speak of her. So... This poem, to me, um, it really kind of emphasizes the fact that these poems that she was creating, they felt dear to her. They felt like children to her, like they were her creation and they were very special to her. Um, And so these poems that didn't make it like to life, quote unquote, that were stillborn, that really saddened her because it felt like they had everything that they needed except they just wouldn't come to life like they had their little toes and fingers they had their foreheads but they just couldn't the lungs couldn't fill with air it's ironic I feel because this poem obviously it was published so you could argue that this poem stillborn was actually uh, it did come to life and so I think that's kind of a fun like use of irony well, you have to remember a lot of these were published though after she had already passed. And so That's maybe she true. never meant to publish it. So maybe she felt like this one itself like didn't have the life that she was looking for. Um, when she says they sit so nicely in the pickling fluid, um, she later says they are not pigs. They are not even fish. So she's saying the poems, they sit in this pickling fluid. They're not pigs. They're not fish. But it would be better if they were. Because what's worse is that they're dead. They're these dead poems that <laughs> will never live. And so what was the point more of it tragic. all? It's more tragic than being, you know, a pig or a fish in life. This poem, it has three stanzas. And I, again, don't know what the meter is. There's not really a rhyme. But I think that this poem is... And I haven't read every single one of her poems. But this poem, to me, of all the ones that I've read shows the most love that she had for creating poetry because this like describes how heartbreaking it is to her whenever she has this poem that she can't fully bring to life and she can't fully get her thoughts onto the paper well and when I read like the part about they're not pigs they're not fish um it's like when you think of those things like they have like almost a lot in life like an expectation it's like they know like pigs and fish like they're gonna be food or they're gonna be like livestock whatever yeah but it's like with this poem there was an expectation that it would be great or that it would go somewhere and when it didn't it almost feels like 
she feels that as like a waste of time or like a waste of like resources because it wasn't being used in the way that she thought it would be. Or like a waste of feelings almost. Yeah. Like she's upset that she even had those feelings in the first place because they couldn't they like, can't come out the way that she wanted them to. I do think my favorite is like when she's like, they're not pigs, they're not even fish, though they do have a piggy and a fishy air. She's like, they sure do smell like it. It's like, well, there was potential, but I don't really know what quite happened with it. Mm -hmm. Sylvia, I hope you have found peace wherever you are. Sylvia, I hope that you haunt someone so that they can write more poems on your behalf. And it can be me if you want. I'm open to that. Join us next week. We are going to be discussing It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. And I know you guys are ready. Then the week after that, we're going to talk about the movie adaptation and possibly who we thought she should have put in it. Yeah, we're going to fan cast it. And it's going to be better than who was cast because that's not hard to do. The week after that, actually, the week of June 5th is an off week. We are having a little family vacation. And so we will be be getting lit up in the mountains. Yeah, we are going to be drinking moonshine till the cows come home. Um, so we'll be busy. Okay. So don't talk to us. Don't don't email us. Don't call. <laughs> but go ahead and get started on it. Ends with us. We're excited to talk about it. We'll talk to you next time. And as always, let's get lit. Bye.